Welcome to another edition of Instant Boxing. I'm your host, Albert Baker. It's time for the opening bell. This week's opening bell segment, you had Gennady, Gedadavich, Golovkin, Triple G taking on Daniel the Miracle Man Jacobs at Madison Square Garden in New York. Triple G, 23 consecutive knockouts, never been past the 11th round. Daniel Jacobs, no slouch himself, coming in off of 12 straight knockouts. This was a fight that was highly anticipated. Was Triple G really the boogeyman, or was he just a product of really good matchmaking? Daniel Jacobs, was he really moved along nicely? Did he find Peter Quillen at the right time? Did he beat cancer and actually get better in his career? It definitely looked like he did come out for the first round. Both fighters have a staring contest. Sit down, heat up a bowl of soup, eat some crackers, go back to their corners, come out for the second and third round. Danny Jacobs boxing nicely, firing his jab, moving in and out with angles, circling around the ring, forcing Triple G to reset his offense as he switched back and forth from southpaw to orthodox stance. Fourth round, Triple G pressing forward, fires the overhand right. Jacobs goes down, looks wobbly, gets up, makes it back to his corner. Fifth round, Triple G comes out and he starts pressing the action, looking really aggressive. In the sixth, Daniel Jacobs gets his bearings back, starts boxing well, firing two, three jabs at a time, starts switching back, orthodox to southpaw, keeps forcing Triple G to reset his offense, Looked really, really good in spots. Triple G still trying to press forward, cut the ring off. This was a fight that was fought at an extremely high level. There's a lot of controversy over the ending of this fight. Judges had 115, 112 on two cards, 114 to 113 on the other card. Unanimous decision for Triple G. This fight wasn't a robbery. This wasn't a robbery, but you could have had this fight scored for Daniel Jacobs. I had this fight scored for Daniel Jacobs at 115, 112, eight to four, minus the one for the knockdown, because I saw Daniel Jacobs take away Triple G's ability to throw punches in combination. Triple G nevertheless boxed well with his jab, cut the ring off, but Daniel Jacobs just boxed that much better than Triple G. That's the reason why I gave the fight to Daniel Jacobs. I know there's a lot of stories out there and myths and legends that say you've got to beat the champ in order to beat the champ, which means you have to be aggressive, come forward and attack the champ in order to beat the champ. Now, Daniel Jacobs did do that. He fired two, three, four jabs at a time. Not all those jabs landed, but Nevertheless, it made Triple G reset his offense. That was meaning that Jacobs was dictating the tempo and pace of the fight. Triple G did not dictate the tempo of the fight enough for me to justify giving him more rounds than Daniel Jacobs. That doesn't mean that Triple G didn't win rounds. He obviously did. He knocked Daniel Jacobs down. In the ninth round, he landed an uppercut and I thought Jacobs was gonna go down again. He clearly won that round. But I had Daniel Jacobs winning eight out of 12 rounds, four for Triple G. On my card, he would have won the fight. In the co-main event, Roman Chocolatito Gonzalez considered number one pound for pound on a lot of different lists, taking on Thailand's Sri Saket Sorung Visai. You kinda gotta say that a little bit different with some emphasis, Sorung Visai. Don't wanna say that 10 times fast, but he was taking on Chocolatito in the co-main event. This was an all action back and forth fight. Sorung Visai came out first round, dropped Chocolatito with a body shot, something that hadn't been seen in almost a decade. Chocolatito down on the canvas, gets up, returns fire. This turns into an all out slugfest as all of Gonzalez's fights have been. Now, since Gonzalez moved up from 112 to 115, Gonzalez no longer carries that knockout power, that devastating, br brutal power that he was showing at 112 and lower. Sorung Visai was there all night to be knocked out by Gonzalez, but Gonzalez didn't have the heat on his punches 
to put Sorong Visai down the same way he put Brian Deloria down a few fights back at 112. Nevertheless, Chocolatito did enough to win the fight, in my opinion. However, the judges didn't see it that way. Having one card a draw, two cards by one point for Sor Rung Visai. Sor Rung Visai, the hero of Thailand, all of a sudden walks away with a majority decision, much to the chagrin of the Nicaraguan fans. It was a close fight. It was an action fight. But Gonzalez did appear to do more than Sor Rung Visai. Between the two, almost 2,000 punches were thrown. Chocolatito throwing over 1,000. Sorong Visay in the upper 900s. This was a good action fight. Chocolatito coming out on the losing end. And that's the opening bell. My grandmother always told me when I was growing up, when you're outside in the world, you're not just representing you, but you're representing your family as well. So make sure you're out there acting right. It's time for the word on the street. Word on the street is that you or somebody you know was really butthurt after the fights on Saturday. And that's okay. It's okay. We're going to put a little, little Desinex on that butt and soothe that thing up. All right. Let's, let's go ahead and heal that butt. You got a little, you got a little bit of butt rash going on. We're, we're going we're, we're gonna to slap some Desitin on you. We're here, put a, little, put a little bit of powder on you and, and we'll send you out the door. It's okay, all right? Take a deep breath, everybody relax. Nothing wrong with getting a little butt hurt after a fight, but just because somebody has a different viewpoint than you, that doesn't make it okay for you to start slamming someone, start hashtagging them YDKSAB, just because they see boxing in a different way than you. I've been covering boxing for years. I probably go to about 40 to 50 live fight cards a year. I live in Southern California. If you want to see live boxing, you can see live boxing almost every single week in Southern California. Now, I wasn't ringside for Triple G Jacobs. I had the opportunity to, to watch this fight from my living room, drink a beer, and enjoy myself while I was watching this fight. Anybody who knows anything about covering live boxing knows that being ringside and watching it on TV are two completely different things. I thought Daniel Jacobs had did enough to win the fight, but I am not a judge and I was not ringside during this fight. When you're ringside for a fight, there's certain ambiances that you get in the atmosphere that help you identify who's actually performing better or winning a fight. There's looks in the fighter's eyes, there's sounds to their breathing, there's subtle nuances in their body language that you see live that you just don't get on TV because you have switching camera angles. You have a lot of other varying factors like the announcers that are selling their HBO fighter uh, that, that make that help you make a decision when you're watching TV on who you think is actually winning the fight. When I watch fights on TV, I like to turn the audio off. Now I'm not saying everybody should do this, but I like to turn the audio off because it gives me an opportunity to watch the fight without any biases being spewed. HBO tends to really be biased towards HBO fighters. Now I'm not saying that these are bad announcers. I really like Max Kellerman. I love Roy Jones Jr. Jim Lampley does great commentary, but they do tend to really hype up fighters because that's their job. That's what they're supposed to do. When you do that, you have an opportunity to see something for what it is as close as possible. Watching a fight on TV will never compare to watching a fight live ringside. So when someone has a different opinion than you of what they saw in a fight, that doesn't necessarily mean they're wrong. It means that they have a different preference of what they saw or different viewpoint of what makes boxing good. Now, all of us can agree that Triple G versus Jacobs was fought at a high level. Whatever your view was of who won is your personal view and no one can take that away from you. If you thought Triple G won that fight, then in your mind, Triple G won that fight. And on the judges' scorecards, he won that fight. He walked away the winner. It's not wrong for someone else to give a valid viewpoint that Daniel Jacobs boxed well and could have won the fight. And that's the word on the street. 
you got the good clean look you're, you're rocking the name brown you probably got the tightest pants on in the house right there. <laughs> I look good. this week's instant boxing spotlight segment undefeated former ibf bantamweight champion randy caballero makes his return march 23rd on espn I can honestly say my childhood, I never lived like a, a normal childhood a kid would live, you know, hanging out with friends, eating junk food, you know, staying out late. Like I said, I'm excited, man, to come back after being out for so long, to be in a car like this with Golden Boy, ESPN, their first card. You know, we're ready to put on a great show for them. You know, not only myself, Jason Quigley, I know, you know, it's a big test in front of them. You know, I think, you know, it's going to be a great night of boxing. You're not going to want to miss it, whether you catch it live at Fantasy or you catch it live on ESPN. You're not going to want to miss it because it's, you know, we're ready to bring boxing back. <laughs> has a title that's what I want anybody that has a has a belt around their waist I'm ready to go grab it from them you know I did it 118 118 where no big names but they were tough fighters though you know a lot of people don't really watch you know 118 fighters it's not a weight class nobody wants to see but um you know I accomplished it at 118 I think I can accomplish it at 122 and uh, like I said whoever has the title that's what I want you know my path right now is going towards WBC but you know, if Golden Boy has another path for me, then so be it. But whoever has the title, that's what I want. This is serious business. In this week's post-fight cooldown, the glaringly obvious is starting to become more and more vitriolic on social media. It's okay to root for a fighter that's your race. It's absolutely okay to root for a fighter that comes from a country that your nationality heralds from. I'm a Mexican-American. I root for Mexican fighters. I'm an American. I root for American fighters. There's nothing wrong with that. That is not racist. If you're a black guy, guess who I expect you to root for? The black guy. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with me rooting for the American fighter. I'm American. There's nothing wrong with me rooting for the Mexican fighter. I'm a Mexican-American. Hell, I'm an eighth Irish. I can root for the Irish fighter. So when someone is rooting for a black fighter because they're black, don't give them shit about it. It's okay. Boxing is one of those sports that kind of transcends all things. People say boxing is the last racist sport or the last nationalistic sport. Uh, yeah, it is. Boxing is the epitome of classic pugilistic combat of man versus man. Naturally, people are going to self-identify with the person who looks just like them. It's human nature. And there's nothing wrong with rooting a fighter who comes from the same exact type of background or living conditions that you do. So enjoy rooting for the fighter that you most identify with, just as everybody else will. But don't be an asshole about it or tell somebody that they're wrong because they want to do that because then, well, that's just racist. And that's the post-fight cooldown. See you next week.